a dollar from your ideal customer is much more valuable than a dollar from just any random uh, customer. Even though right. your bank manager will tell you they're equal, they're not equal. It's the principle of the unequal dollar. If you're winning customers on price, then chances are you're actually losing customers on price as well, says today's Ask an Expert. Hi, I'm Joshua Carlson, co-founder of Propella Media. Today, I sit down with Alan Dib. He's the author of the wildly popular book, The One Page Marketing Plan. And today, we're going to talk about how you can simplify your marketing. 35 page marketing plan may seem great while you're strategizing at a retreat, but when it comes time to execution, you need something that's more streamlined and more actionable. We're also gonna talk about the importance of building a good team behind you. We as entrepreneurs oftentimes take on too much. So Alan's gonna share his personal story about how he delegated and built a very effective team. And finally, Alan's gonna talk about the topic of augmenting versus automating. We often think with marketing, we want to automate as much as possible. Alan actually says, no, we want to augment because by augmenting, we stay true to who we are. We still maintain a personalized experience, which helps improve the customer experience. Now let's hear what Alan has to say. Alan, thank you so much for coming on our Ask an Expert series. Hey, pleasure to be on. All right, so I wanna start uh, with the book. You are the author of the One Page Marketing Plan, uh, but you're an IT guy from background, so I'd like to just talk about how this bridge came to be. <laughs> uh, I used to be an IT guy many, 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 many years ago, so, um, uh, but still a tech geek, uh, okay. for sure. So that's how I started my business life as a tech geek. You know, I started, my business life uh, working for someone else as, a, as an IT guy. I thought I was smart enough to start my own business and that's exactly what I did. And um, so, yeah, so I started uh, back in the day uh, an IT company um, and uh, I really struggled to, to get new clients in the door. And that, that's kind of what took me on my journey to, to learning marketing and understanding marketing. Uh, it was really the need that I had to get new clients in the door uh, daily, weekly, monthly. Okay. And so I want to go back to when you actually were thinking about putting this book together, because content creation is something that every business leader is instructed or it's recommended, Hey, get into, start doing content. A book is a pretty arduous uh, piece of content. So yeah. what was that process like for you to actually begin writing the book? Um, it actually came together very, very quickly after okay. I had the out outline and the concept. In fact, I think it took me about 30 to 40 days to, to write it. I mean, I was writing like a madman. Um, I, 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 I was, uh, I had a uh, very hard stop, but I had already had the concept already had the outline. And so it was a matter of filling in the blanks. Uh, so from that perspective, it wasn't too hard. It, once, once I had that concept and once I had the, um, the outline, it was a matter of just getting uh, pen to paper or, or um, uh, <laughs> uh, staring at the keyboard to screen. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, and so that, that's, that was my process. So I basically knocked it out over 30, 40 days. I was working 16 uh, hour days most of the time. Um, but you know, that's the way I work. I sort of cram, get it all done. Cause otherwise I would have just procrastinated for years doing little bits and pieces. Sure. Well, so once you have the book finished and it's published, what was the marketing strategy? What was, what was the way that you got the, the book out there? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. I, I see we, we've done the opposite of what most authors do. So most authors, they do a big splash for one, two, three months, and then they go on to their next project and, and so on and so forth. Um, this book's been out for a few years now, and we now put more behind marketing the book now than we ever have before. So uh, for, for, for us, the book is a real strong uh, front end, uh, top of funnel, um, and it drives a lot of our opt-ins, a lot of our sales, a lot of our uh, our traction. So um, it's to us, it's um, something that we put a lot of time and effort into promoting. We run ads to the book. Um, we use it in um, free offers, all, all of that sort of thing. And so, um, so we now put more resource behind marketing the book now than ever before. Um, some of the things that we do is like, like what we're doing now, getting on onto podcasts as, as guests. Uh, we reach out to bloggers who've reviewed similar books. Uh, we run paid ads. 
um, we run all sorts of uh, promos and things like that. So, um, and, and we've also focused on getting good distribution of the book as well. Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because I do think that that's, it's kind of the, the genesis for a lot of the recommendations to go into the content business. Um, mm -hmm. But what I love about what you just said is it wasn't a three, four month splash. It's something that is exactly. actually, it's been a long ongoing process for you. And it's clearly paying dividends from a lead gen standpoint. For sure, for sure. And, you know, it's, it kind of gels with the philosophy that I teach is that marketing is not an event, it is a process. So it's not something that you do once, okay, and we're, now we're done. Um, it's, it's an ongoing process that we, we need to build uh, and keep going. Okay, well, what I love about the process that you've, uh, you've outlined is you've made it simple. Um, you know, it's a one page marketing plan, which is fantastic because yeah. 30 page marketing plan sounds good and it works great on retreats, but <laughs> when you actually go into the execution phase, you know, you, you tend to get lost in the weeds. Um, exactly. You've broken it up into three components. Um, can you talk about what those three primary components are? Yeah, so um, the, the the three major phases of the one page marketing plan, and if you're listening to this and you're uh, thinking visually, so the one page marketing plan is actually, uh, if you visualize a single page and it's broken into three major phases and then each phase has three steps in it. So overall, there are nine blocks on the one page marketing plan, but as, as you say, it's broken up into three major phases. I've called them before, during, and after. Okay. Um, sometimes I've heard them referred to as uh, attract, nurture, and convert. Um, sure. So there's a few different uh, ways, or or attract, uh, convert, deliver is another another way I've seen that done. But whatever whatever you you call it, really, I call it before, during, and after. So before okay. someone know, knows that you exist. Uh, when they've uh, kind of indicated interest, but they're kind of vaguely interested, and then we take them through to conversion, that's the during phase. And then the after phase is once they've become a client, um, how do we become, uh, make them a raving fan and get them to refer new business to you and do more with you uh, over time. So they're the three major phases of the marketing process. And so the book is broken up into those three major acts. So, uh, you know, just like a, um, just like a, um, a movie or a play or whatever, it's usually broken up into three major acts. And so right. good marketing, I, oh, I think is the name. Okay, well, I want to get into some of those acts, but what I want to first talk about is the importance of developing a good team around you. Um, can you talk about how you built your team? Yeah, uh, so I believe team is the superpower of business. And so many times I see that business owners have kind of Superman syndrome. And what I mean by that is, you know, uh, if something needs to be done, right, they're Superman, they just go, go and get it done. And that works fine for a while um, when you're small, when you're starting out, that's fine. Um, but it r really puts a cap on your scalability because, um, you know, I've, I've spoken to audiences uh, many times around the world. And one of, uh, one of the questions I say is who here wants to double their business? And of course, everybody puts their hand up and I say, well, well that's easy let's just double the number of hours you work uh, and nobody's very enthused by that answer and I said all right well if we don't want to double the, if you want to double your revenue but you don't want to double the hours that you work then we need to find a way to make to create leverage in your business and one of the best ways to do that is by building a team business is a team sport I always say that uh, so uh, building your building your team is incredibly important from two aspects. One, in terms of being able to leverage your time. So we can't get more than 24 hours each. So we need to buy other people's time, but also from the having the right personalities within our business. And I talk, I kind of touch on this in the book very briefly, but I'll I'll be talking about it in a lot more detail in my next book. But we need three types of personalities in our business yeah. to make them work. So we need the entrepreneur. That's yeah. people like you and I, the visionary people, people who are big picture. We always come up with sure. new products, new services. And most businesses have that covered. It's usually the, the founder of the business. Then we need the specialist. That's the person who implements your vision. So it might be the coder, it might be the venture capitalist, it might be whoever. And again, most businesses generally have that covered. Sometimes it's the entrepreneur, sometimes it's someone they're 
entrepreneur works with or employs. Uh, but the one that's often missing, particularly from a marketing perspective, is what I call the manager role. And yeah. so the manager role is the person who just comes in every day from a marketing perspective is making sure that things are getting done. You know, so are we getting those emails sent out? Are we getting uh, optimizing the funnel? Are we getting uh, pay-per-click ads done? All of that sort of thing. And that's the stuff that entrepreneurs are really bad at. We'll do it once, <laughs> twice, three times, and we get bored. Yeah. Uh, we move on to the next thing or we get busy. Oh, we'll come back to that. We never do. Um, and so this is where team really fills those gaps. Okay. Well, so I have a question about building that team. It's good to identify who mm -hmm. um, or the types of personalities that we want. Um, do you have a trick to, to making sure that you get a good hire? I, I heard this recommendation forever ago, which was quick to fire, slow to hire. Um, but it, it's harder than that because finding those good people that fit, you know, is sometimes tricky. If you found anything that accelerates that process. Yeah, I have, I, I, I've, I've built a team the right way and the wrong way. And okay. the wrong way was where I was kind of the linchpin in the middle. Everybody reported to me and things kind of, I, I was that conduit that had, uh, uh, you know, information passing to and fro. And that that's bad because you become a bottleneck. You know, someone, uh, you're working with the web developer, then the web developer is asking for copy, then you're working with a copywriter. And so you're that mm, critical linchpin. Uh, so that was the way that it really didn't work for me. The way okay. that it did work was for me to, for my first hire to be the person who's going to be potentially my team leader, the person okay. who's going to run my team. And then um, he or she, in, in my case, it's a she, uh, she hired everyone else in the team. And so that does two things. So first of all, she's going to hire people that she uh, yeah. is happy working with day to day. Right. But the second thing is she feels more responsible for the team's success success so because she's made the hire she's done the training all of that and so that massively frees me up because hiring and hr is quite quite labor intensive uh, yeah. but it also from a day-to-day -day management point of view i don't need to worry who's in today who's sick today who has you know got what on their to-do list all of that sort of thing i'm able to run my team very very time efficiently so i have two uh, meetings uh, every week with my team leader. Uh, yeah. They go for about 30 minutes, sometimes up to an hour if we've got a lot to discuss. And then we just smash out all of the decisions. So, you know, budget approvals, uh, status of projects, what's happening with this or that, whatever else. And so we smash that out in, you know, an hour a week uh, okay. is, is what it takes for me to manage that team. And then she handles the day to day. And I found that that works far, far better for someone who's an entrepreneur style personality than being that conduit where everybody's reporting to me and I'm needing to be on the pulse of exactly what's going on everywhere. Yeah, you, I definitely think that delegation is important to be able to scale up. Otherwise, you hit that ceiling. Um, mm. It just prevents you from going forward. Um, okay, I want to go back to the marketing process in itself. Um, we're, we're a marketing agency. We're big on being data forward. Um, it starts with the data. So from a targeting standpoint, when you're looking at the marketplace, what kind of recommendations do you guys have as far as trying to identify the ideal target audience? Yeah, so uh, ideal target audience uh, it can be a tricky one um, if you're starting from zero. Uh, uh, most people are not starting from zero, so they've got some good ideas around their ta their ideal target audience. Um, often it's a matter of uh, starting out with segmentation. So figuring out, okay, we've got these three major segments. So you might, you might have a small business uh, segment, which might be say a one to one to 10 million revenue range. Then you might have a corporate segment and then maybe you've got a startup segment. And so identifying some of the segments uh, that you service and then have having a, a real, uh, scale to try and figure out who are our most valuable clients. So, mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily who are, who is bringing in the most revenue, but it's really who's bringing in the most profit, who's sure. fun to deal with and who really appreciates and values what you do. Because, you know, you, someone can be, pay you a lot of money, but it takes a lot of manpower, a lot of effort to service them. Um, they might be price sensitive or, or all of those sorts of things. So I like to look for the intersection of 
who's fun to deal with because really we we want to uh, we want monday to be a fun day uh, we want to be looking forward to monday not yeah. groaning and think you know we're in in business for ourselves right so we we want it to be fun if we wanted life to be boring and uh, and to suck we would probably work for someone else right but we're <laughs> we're entrepreneurs for a reason so so who's fun to deal with uh, so that that's certainly a factor that i look at who's profitable to deal with so uh, not just revenue so it's not just about the turnover it's about the leftover and then who's really going to value very much who what you do and so that that's my starting point for target market and then you can drill down within that of course segment that um, and then uh, go go much deeper into building an, an avatar around that but that's my starting point I want the intersection of who's fun to deal with who's going to value what I do and who's highly profitable. Do you have a recommendation for those businesses that uh, are kind of in the mode that, Hey, we'll, we want to take any customer we can get um, because I believe mm -hmm. what you're saying, which is, Hey, there's this ideal customer that we have out there. It's fun. It's profitable. They get what we do. Yeah. If we fed the funnel with more of those, we'd be in a much better place. But a lot of businesses are just clamoring for the next sale as opposed to the right sale. Yeah, yeah. I, I I talk about this in the book as well. Look, it's it's a challenge when when you're particularly when you're beginning and you feel like you want to cast the net very wide. And right. so, the problem with casting the net very wide is that you catch a lot of things that you don't want, or catch a lot of things that are, that may be not good for you. Um, and I talk about this in the book. I call it um, polluted revenue. And the the idea is that a dollar from your ideal customer is much more valuable than a dollar from just any random uh, customer. Even though right. your bank manager will tell you they're equal, they're not equal. It's the principle of the unequal dollar. So uh, the reason being uh, that someone who's price sensitive, who complains a lot, who doesn't pay their bills on time, who is difficult to deal with, uh, they're going to suck a lot more time and resource from your business than somebody who is a promoter, who's a fan of what you do, who's profitable, who pays on time, who's easy and fun to deal with. Um, and so uh, they're not equal. And so you need to, you need to, from a marketing perspective, be targeting your ideal customer. Now that doesn't mean that you can't take business outside of your ideal customer. So if someone comes to you, maybe they're not your ideal customer, but from a cash flow perspective, you want to take that on, that's fine. But what I'm saying is as from a marketing perspective, you've got limited firepower, meaning uh, you've got a limited budget, you've got limited time, you've got limited energy. And so we want to really laser focus that firepower on your ideal target market rather than just going broad and firing everywhere and hoping that we hit a hit someone who's a, a good potential target. We want to be very laser focused from a marketing perspective about who we want uh, and uh, why we want to deal with them. I love it. Love the concept of dollars not being equal because I think that that's very mm -hmm. true. Um, let's talk about nurturing. Um, what are the things we need to keep in mind when we are starting to onboard somebody and we want to nurture them into a, a long-term customer? Yeah. So, so nurturing is all about uh, tar uh, expanding your addressable target market. And here's what I mean by that. Um, the, if you, if we were looking at a pie chart of your target market, there's about 3% who are ready to buy today. They're hot, they're ready to go. Um, you know, so it's somebody who's ready to buy that car today, or they're ready to, to sign on with an agency today or, or wh whatever else. And everybody is fighting for that 3% target right. market. So that's what people are paying Google ads for. They're paying Facebook ads. Uh, the cost per clicks are very high for those people. Um, and right, rightly so, right? So we all, yeah. we all want to deal with those hot prospects and that's great. But the thing is, right, everybody knows how to deal with a hot prospect who's ready to buy today. You know, you know, click the buy button now or sign sign the proposal here or whatever else. There's no mystery on on how to deal with them. Everybody knows how to deal with them. But what we find is there's approximately another seven percent of your target market who are quite open to buying. And so maybe they've got some questions. Maybe they need a little bit of pushing over the line. Maybe they've got 
uh, they need just some help or a demo or, or whatever else. Then we find there's another 30% who are interested, but not right now. So what that means is they might be ready to buy in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, a year, two years uh, time. And so that, that is a really massive segment of the market that very few people are addressing because, you know, someone walks onto a uh, car dealership lot, hey, what can I do to get you into a car today, right? right. Uh, right. Uh, um, and if I say, look, oh, I'm not ready to buy today, I'm ready to buy maybe in a, in a month or two. Well, most car dealers will say, look, oh, that's a tire kicker, you know, so I'm not going to engage with them. But um, th that's actually a massive segment because if you think about it, if you're buying of anything of reasonably high value, and hopefully everyone who's uh, listening to this sells something of reasonably high value, someone's not going to wake up that morning and think, okay, I need to buy a car today or, or whatever. You'll, you will spend some time trying to make some uh, informed decisions, trying to educate yourself, trying to figure out um, what some of your options are and what, what's the best approach and, and all of that. And so if you can be part of that conversation with that ideal prospect, who's going to be ready in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, a year, two years time, then you're going to build a massive pipeline of future uh, clients and you're going to be top of mind when they do become ready to buy. And this is where the sophisticated marketer comes in because like I said, everybody knows how to deal with a hot prospect, but not many people know how to deal with a prospect who's ready to buy in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, a year or two years. And so that's that's a really, really important part of your, your whole marketing funnel is expanding from that 3% of hot buyers right. to that 40% of people who are ready, but not uh, who are interested, but not right now. And people who are maybe open to listening to, to your message. Um, so you increasing that addressable market from 3% to 40%, that's a 1200% increase in uh, your addressable market. And that can make a massive difference to your business. And so how do you systematically go um, or approach that nurture strategy? Um, are there tools that you've utilized that help, you know, facilitate that? Yeah, uh, at the center of it is really your CRM system, your marketing okay. automation, and whether you do that via email, which is very common, or maybe you might use an offline uh, approach, or maybe you use a multimedia uh, approach. The whole point is, I want to keep in touch with that ideal audience until they're ready to buy. And what do I keep in touch with? So yes, uh, uh, you might send, it might be as simple as a, as a monthly newsletter, but more and more, if you can take them through the journey of uh, learning and getting educated around what it is that, that they're looking for, if you can be part of that conversation that's going on in their mind, help yeah. them, help them make a, uh, a more informed decision, then you're going to be in pole position when they are ready to buy. And, you know, everybody would rather buy from a friend than, than just some random stranger who wants to make yeah. a commission. And so if you can become uh, that person in their life, who's adding a lot of value and helping them uh, come to a decision. So it might be depending on what your industry is, it might be data that might help them. It may be just uh, stories and case studies. It may be just a connection around um, how they use that product or service within their business or within their, within their lives. Um, so uh, taking them through that journey of, of going from vaguely interested to being more interested to really getting their attention and, and, and being ready when they're ready to buy. Okay. So once they have purchased, um, I've heard you talk about making sure you have world-class customer experience um, and customer experience is something that I've heard echoed through many of the guests that we've had on here. Um, so I'd love to hear your philosophy on, you know, making sure that customer experience is top notch. A customer experience is incredibly important. And again, it, it goes back to the whole idea that we don't want just uh, people 
uh, who are transactionally buying from us, who are buying from us because we're the lowest price or the most convenient or whatever. I mean, those those are, are, are fine, but a customer won on price is going to be lost on price. So yeah. what we want is we want to build that tribe of raving fans. So people who who just love what we do, who are uh, uh, open to, to buying whatever it is, uh, that we're we're offering, and so a world, delivering a world class experience is very very key to that. So how can you create that moat around your your clients? How can you become the mayor of your town? So someone who's yeah. a voice of value to your tribe, who's uh, providing thought leadership, who's providing commentary, who's providing um, even entertainment to some extent, because. We want to create theatre around our our products and services. It's it's not just about, um, you know, uh, just being transactional. You know, uh, sometimes you'll deal with different companies, and I think uh, uh, Apple really sort of pioneered this, where you know it, they create theatre around their products and services, like even just unpackaging. You know, you open the you open a new iPhone box, and it is. <laughs> you know, sort of just yep. slides out and it's packaged just beautifully and everything. I mean, they could have just shoved it in a cardboard box with some some protective packaging, right? Sure. Like a lot of consumer electronics, but they're creating a bit of theater uh, around it. And so to the extent that, you know, uh, people create these unboxing videos, which is like, you know, a 10 minute video of some guy exactly. unwrapping, yep. unwrapping his iPhone or whatever, <laughs> right? So, um, uh, so uh, create creating that theater and entertainment around Around your product and service, even if what you sell is is serious, you can you can do that because people will tolerate a lot of things, but they won't tolerate being bored. You can't bore someone into into buying, and so uh, that's what we really want to do from a from a from a um, customer experience perspective is create that theater and build that tribe and put a moat around that tribe. So I love that because basically you're taking one customer experience and you're amplifying that into the marketplace because if they're that excited about doing a 10 minute unboxing video, right? Yes. Suddenly you've touched, you know, a hundred X. Is there an exercise or a practice that you recommend to, I guess, explore your current customer experience and then think about how to approach it differently to say, Hey, we need to we need to come up with something innovative or at least exciting. Um, yeah. What's the process to go through that? Yeah, I'm so surprised, especially as a business grows, uh, at how how little um, the entrepreneur or business owner actually ends up talking to end customers. So, particularly if you're doing something that's slightly removed from the customer, like maybe e-commerce or maybe you've got other people delivering your product or, or, or service. Often we become detached from uh, the actual customer experience. And, you know, I, I once worked with a gentleman who who uh, said, you know, if you want to know what the problems in your business are, just uh, spend a couple of hours on your help desk uh, every week, you know, so look at what some of the tickets that are coming in, spend some time on the phones as a phone operator, yeah. and you will know all of the problems that are that are in your business, you're going to hear all the complaints and all of those because, you know, if you've got a management structure and if you've got a, a decent, a reasonably sized business, you're going to be one or two removed from that. And, you know, your people may not be reporting to you all of the things that are happening on the ground. And so you need to be across that customer experience from a ground level basis, at least periodically uh, so that you know what's actually going on and speaking to customers can be so valuable and you can speak to customers uh, from a formal perspective like a survey and I, I think surveys have their place and they are important but also recognize they're, they're great for gathering mass data yeah. but also have having some open-ended questions on sure. surveys where you can grab the exact phrases and uh, terminology that your customer base is using. So you'd use a, an open-ended question like, you know, what are the biggest challenges in your business right now or things like that, where we're getting that open-ended feedback is really important. And I think nothing kind of uh, substitutes for directly speaking to your customer base and hearing, hearing directly from them uh, informally um, uh, how their experience is going. Well, CEOs and founders take note. You should be getting on the phones. You should jump into the help desk that you'd recommend. Um, because what's crazy about this is that they started there, 
right? Most of them, you know, these businesses. And so they were able to adapt and listen to the customers. But then as the business grows, they get detached from it and they just lose that pulse of the marketplace and their customers. Exactly. Exactly. So being on that pulse and understanding what some of the biggest uh, frustrations, biggest issues, but more, and and importantly, what what are customers loving, uh, you know, so that you can amplify those things as well. Okay, so if we build, if we get the CEOs, we get the high level managers back into the pulse zone, they're listening, they're hearing, they're adapting, and let's say they create the best customer experience, they're going to get this natural amplification. But are there ways or are there strategies we can use to just reach into our customer base? We know they're happy and maybe we're not sending them over the moon, but they're pretty happy because they keep coming back to use our service. How do we stimulate them? to become advocates for our business and our service. Yeah. A a lot of people talk about um, referrals and getting, getting referrals. Um, So um, it's often, uh, you know, really understanding the psychology of referrals is important. You know, why does someone refer new business to you? Um, You know, people feel like it's someone doing a favor for you. Now that can be part of it, but, that's, I think that is the smallest part of it. If you go back and think about the last time you recommended a restaurant to a friend or relative or, or a movie, you saw this awesome movie and you, you, yeah. you told a friend who you thought would like it. Were you trying to do a favor for the restaurant? Were you trying to do a favor for the movie chain? Probably not. No. You, 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 you had a great time. You thought your, your, your friend would also have a really good time. And if your friend visited that restaurant and said, wow, that was awesome. Thank you so much for that recommendation. Um, you feel good because uh, you gave that good experience to your, to your friend, right? So it re- it's really kind of selfishly motivated to some extent. You want to feel good because you or feel good or look good because you've uh, recommended something to your friend or relative that they wouldn't have had w- without you. And so understanding that most referrals are done from that perspective can help you can really help you empower in orchestrating and stimulating referrals so one of the strategies that i really like to do and i work with with clients on is how can we arm our referral network so how can we give them something that they can pass on that's of value that will make them look good not us look good so sure An example in my business, uh, I give away copies of my book all the time. And so what I'll do is if I send you a copy of my book, I'll send you two copies. I'll send you one for you Mm -hmm. and one for you to give to a friend or or a relative uh, or a colleague. And so you giving, you know, nominally $20 worth of value to your friend or relative, that's going to make you look good, right? But it's also going to pass on my, my information. And so... Uh, whether it be uh, a voucher that you pass on, whether it be a book, a book is a great thing that that you can uh, arm your referral network with because people are kind of conditioned to to not throwing books out, and you know they're kind of almost revered, right? People put them yeah. on their shelf like trophies, right? Yeah, yeah they're almost, almost like sin, artifacts. Sin to throw. Yeah, it's almost like a sin to throw out a, a book, right? So yeah, totally. Uh, <clears throat> so th- that can be super powerful. So. Figure out how can you arm your referral network so that they look good by referring new business to you? Okay. So as far as where we are at today, which where we are at today may be different from when this actually goes live, uh, mm-hmm. given how tumultuous the, uh, the environment has been. But yeah. what are things that you're, it's, it's a two-parter. What are things you're seeing businesses are struggling with right now? Um, and what are, what are businesses that you see that are doing well in today's climate? Yeah. So, so, um, so right now with the, the whole pandemic situation, I'm seeing a lot of people who have adapted to, to digital are obviously doing really, really well. I've got clients who are in e-commerce who are just absolutely killing it. Um, and then um, people who've kind of had legacy businesses that were potentially on life support to some extent prior uh, are now uh, really struggling and, you know, they're potentially going to, going to go out of business. I think this is a, a, a bit of a clearing. Um, but either way, whether, uh, whether you're doing well or whether you're not doing well, I think it's important now to, to really think about one of the 
questions that I, I commonly get is, you know, is it okay to do marketing now? Like, I mean, I don't want to seem like an insensitive jerk and all of this sort of stuff, right? And no, no one does. Um, so of course we need to adjust our messaging. We can't be tone deaf, right? So we need to acknowledge what's going on. We need to adjust uh, our messaging, uh, maybe tone down some of the fear in our messaging uh, sure. because, you know, there's enough fear in the, in the air at the moment. So, um, and so, uh, potentially even pivot some of our uh, product offerings. So um, right now, a lot of people uh, are taking uh, physical events that, you know, people who've been in event businesses, they're pivoting into a digital space. They may be charging less for the event, but getting more people to attend uh, uh, on a digital basis. That's certainly what I'm doing as well. Um, so, adjust and maybe even bringing forward products and services that you may have had on your roadmap where particularly uh, I've seen companies where th they were going to do something down the track like a membership service or uh, something uh, where a digital add-on and they're now bringing these forward and making them uh, the centerpiece of, of what they've got to offer. So, um, so basically um, adjust your messaging Bring forward uh, potential projects that may you may have had on the roadmap map that would do well right now, um, and really just uh, engage with the audience. The money hasn't evaporated, right? A lot of right. people think you know that that nobody's spending money anymore and all of that sort of stuff. Not true at all. Um, so people are, are, are the the money is still there. You just need to adjust how you're speaking to your target market and make sure you're you're reaching the right target market as well. Well, I can echo that. A lot of the guests that we've had on um, and a lot of the successful businesses that we've talked to um, are talking about how this moment in time has simply accelerated things that were already on the roadmap, right? So rather than waiting six months, mm -hmm. 18 months to implement, like you said, a, a new membership platform, now mm -hmm. is the time to, to capitalize because the money's still there. Um, I just talked to a former colleague today who they work in the hotel space and their sales are up over what they were last year because uh, of the pent up demand from people being stuck at home for so long. Mm, mm, so absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So I want to shift gears and just talk about marketing channels in general. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've listened to you speak quite a bit. And one thing that brings music to my ears is um, the efficacy of direct mail. And I think that that's mm -hmm. still a, a viable. A lot of people think it's old school, but it still has a, an important role in today's marketplace. Um, yeah. But I also want to talk about new channels as well. We're obviously doing this over video right now. Uh, yeah. You're thousands and thousands of your time zones away. In fact, you're in the future in Australia right now. <laughs> yeah. um, and videos transformed a lot of what we do. How should businesses be looking at the channels that they use in today's marketplace? Yeah, so um, what, one of the things that I often uh, see that's happening in, in the marketing automation space particularly is people trying to figure out how can I get robots to replace what I do from a marketing perspective? How can I get automation to take over? And how can I automate all, all my marketing? And I kind of li liken it to... Um, I don't know if you have this in the movie Iron Man, right? So, yeah. so Iron Man, he's a normal geeky guy, but when he puts on the Iron Man suit, he can fly, he can shoot lasers, he can do all of this sort of thing. And this is how I view marketing technology and marketing automation, like that Iron Man suit. It's not replacing him, it's augmenting his abilities. Mm -hmm. so, so what I want is for marketing automation, marketing technology, video, everything like that, uh, all of those things. I want them to augment my abilities. I don't want them just to be a replacement and remove all the personality from, from my marketing and re do all of that. So uh, a lot of people are thinking about it wrong. They're thinking about automation when they should be thinking about augmentation instead. Mm -hmm. And so um, that translates to every part of the business, whether you're doing video, whether you're doing autoresponders, all of those things. So when I'm writing an autoresponder sequence, I'm thinking, how would I write this if, um, if it were to make it feel like a real person is sending this? But then sure. importantly, um, I don't want to do stuff like, you know, you see these big companies do, like they send an autoresponder sequence. It's got all of these, 
um, HTML everywhere. It comes from no reply at or sales at or whatever. Yeah. It feels doesn't feel personal, right? I, whereas my autoresponder sequences, they feel like they're coming from a person. I encourage people to reply uh, so that they know that there's a live person on the on the end of that. And so that way, I'm essentially augmenting what I do from a from a marketing perspective rather than uh, sending emails one by one. I, I can send them on mass, but the replies go to a real person and then we can get into a, a conversation. So, um, so from that perspective, you can, you can do some very, very clever things with video. I think now you can do things, you can do things, uh, again, uh, how would I replicate a one-on-one -on -one situation with you? So I can send you a personal video. I can say, Hey, Joshua, um, uh, I've come across your website. I noticed you're doing these things right, but you can, have these these two or three optimizations that we can put in place so again rather than thinking mass uh really thinking about how you you can create um uh, personalization at scale well i like that because i just had a personal experience with a large um it's a suit company and it's yep. a it's a national suit company and they sent me a notification the other day to say hey your loyalty points are about ready to expire and when I responded to say, hey, I think this feels a little bit tone deaf right now, uh, it was to a do not reply email address. Yes. And I, I just, it baffles me that this has become a practice <laughs> Yeah. When, you know, we talk about engagement and, and building customer experience, um, that companies are still doing this today. So I applaud you for saying, hey, don't automate, but augment mm. and, yes. and really stay true to who you are. Yeah. Um, so powerful message. Um, is there anything that we haven't covered right now that you think is important that businesses should be cognitive of? Look, look um, I think this is appropriate both now and, and really anywhere. Um, what I found is... Uh, unfortunately, um, a lot of businesses think that having the best product or best service is the thing that's going to get them recognition in the marketplace and win in the marketplace. And I wish that were true. I wish that automatically the best product, best services won in the marketplace, but we know that that's not true. And what we find is something that a mentor told me a long time ago. He said, the best marketer always wins. Um, so, so it's not the best product or service. It's the best marketer uh, who wins. And so my, my encouragement to all business owners and entrepreneurs is to get better at marketing, you know, because it's a real lever. It, it creates a lot of leverage in your business. If you get 10% better at financial analysis, great. If you get 10% better at negotiation, great. They can all have incremental effects, but if yeah. you get 10% better at marketing, that can be worth millions and millions to your bottom line. That can have an exponential effect. And so your job is to become the best marketer of what you do. So don't think that you're a dentist, a butcher, baker, candlestick maker. You're a marketer of dental services. You're a marketer of medical services. You're a marketer of legal services, whatever business you're in. And so having that mindset shift will make a really, really big difference because uh, if you think of yourself as a marketer first, then that's going to help you uh, win in the marketplace and rather than focusing all your energy on product and service. Well, I love that one of our first guests, Jack Daly, talked about, um, I asked him, hey, Jack, if you could go back in time, he's very successful, you know, he's over 70s, mm -hmm. had a lot of different yeah. businesses. Yeah. Um, but I said, hey, if you could go back in time and you could, you could do one thing different, he said that he would become a bigger proponent of champion his success you know, really getting, amplifying, you know, how powerful um, his business was, how successful it was, as opposed mm. to just being successful, right? And, and that's exactly yeah. what you're talking about, because if you can get the word out there, it doesn't matter if you have the greatest, you know, service in the world. If nobody hears about it, you're just really going to be servicing yourself for a short period of time. Exactly, exactly. All right. Well, great place to end. I really appreciate having you on, Alan. Uh, a lot of great insights that we can share. Um, where can people get the book? Yeah. So the people can get the book on Amazon or wherever books are sold, Barnes and Noble, wherever your favorite bookstore. Um, you can grab, uh, you can, even if you didn't want the book, you can grab a copy of the one page marketing plan canvas. That's on my 
uh, website at successwise.com. And if you're not a big reader, if you prefer to listen, my book is on Audible as well. All right, perfect. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Pleasure. Lovely being on. Great.